something special for reaching uh, 70 subscribers. I put a little slice of life video out there that was just kind of, I don't know, a spur of the moment. I just was recording myself playing guitar with my cat in the background, and it was a really peaceful, beautiful day outside, so I just threw that up there. Um, but I wanted to do, like, an actual, like, you know, ASMR video for you know, to show my appreciation for the 70 of you who, uh, who went out there and subscribed. Uh, there was a little bit of a joke video a bit before that where I asked, uh, we were at 68 and I just wanted one more person to subscribe so we could hit 69. Um, and you, uh, you, you devils out there, a couple of you, uh, all subscribed at once and I think we went straight from 68 to like 72. Um, I'm not complaining though. <laughs> I'm disappointed we never got to see 69 subscribers. I mean, at some point it was out there. zipped right past it, and now we are at, uh, I think we're at like 74, 75, um, but, you know, for, I, I like to try to do a, a, a milestone video for each, you know, 10 that we, uh, that we get for the channel, um, so I wanted to make a, uh, <coughs> a video for you guys, um, for 70, um, because I didn't think that the, uh, the 70 subscriber special that I made, the slice of life, you know, thing, it wasn't, like, ASMR, it wasn't very, like, for the channel, so, um, I wanted to, uh, kind of make a video, uh, that is special because, because my channel is kind of split, uh, it's mostly, like, a lot of you enjoy the, uh, Magic the Gathering content, like, Magic the Gathering is probably the most watched, um, content on my channel, so, uh, I do have a contingent of people who just watch, um, or primarily watch or found me because of, uh, the gaming ASMR videos, like the Octopath Traveler, or Final Fantasy IX, or Final Fantasy VII, or maybe some of the Pokemon that I've been playing, um, and stuff like that, so I feel like I have a mixed audience, I have a lot of, you know, Magic the Gathering, you know, consumers, you know, people who like to consume that kind of content, and I have uh, a lot of people who are here for the games, um, so I'm kind of, I'm doing something to kind of hopefully, uh, appease, or not appease, but, you know, hopefully, Hopefully the people who are here for Final Fantasy and stuff like that, hopefully you can watch this video and it can get you, um, it, maybe if, if not interested in, it can help you understand the Magic the Gathering content more. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a game of Magic the Gathering by myself, which is incredibly sad. Um, but I'm going to be talking through how the game is played for you so you can maybe learn how the game is played so that when you watch my other videos, if, you know, if maybe you haven't been familiar with Magic before, you will be now, um, so that, that, you know, that content becomes more relevant for you. Um, I don't really have a script or anything written out, so this is going to be very off the cuff, um, so I might not get all the rules right, I might not get everything right, but I'm going to try to get the basics down for you. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to go through every nook and cranny of how the game is played. If, if, if you've watched this video and you enjoy it, I highly recommend you go out and either download Arena or uh, maybe just look up other, you know, more, uh, more in-depth videos on how the game is played so that you can understand it in more depth uh, how the game is played and, you know, the things you can do and, and you know, how things work, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is going to be very bare bones, very minimalistic and just kind of a, a, a kind of a snapshot into one game that I've set up for myself and get into the, what I, what I just said a little, in a little bit, but, um, you know, it, it's just going to be a snapshot of a game for you to just kind of see, you know, the very basics of how the game is played, how, how things are, how, how spells get cast, what lands do, um, things like that, how, how you know, what, uh, powers and toughness is of creatures, how they, um, how they matter in terms of the game, how attacking works, how blocking works, um, keywords on cards and creatures specifically, you know, things like First Strike, um, Vigilance, uh, things like that, how those, those work. I mean, I don't even know if we'll, you know, if my game will, will get to the point where we can see things like Vigilance. I have a, I have a card in this deck with Vigilance, and I have cards in this deck that can get First Strike, um, but <clears throat> who knows, maybe we'll play a couple games because there's, there's a very real possibility. This is an aggro deck, which is, uh, aggro is short for aggressive. Um, aggro decks are decks that try to win the game very fast. They use cheap and efficient creatures to try to, um, overwhelm your, their opponent very quickly. So this, this deck tries to end games quickly. Um, 
Um, so there's a chance that these games will end quickly. Um, but on the other side of the table is my uh, my my love, my Golgari mid-range deck um, over here. Um, so this deck, uh, it plays uh, expensive but powerful spells. It also, you know, it, it plays cheap, uh, uh, cheap hand disruption, uh, ways to look into your opponent's hand and get rid of something that might be a big problem. It plays cheap spells that, uh, you know, draw more cards to help you find, you know, dig through your library to find uh, maybe answers to threats or maybe deploy your own, uh, you know, large creature to kind of stabilize the battlefield. Uh, powerful removal spells, so spells to kill your opponent's uh, resources, creatures or enchantments, things like that. Um, so this is a, a deck that uh, it doesn't try to kill your opponent as fast as possible. It tries to outvalue your opponent by drawing cards, library manipulation, big creatures, and things like that. So, um, you know, when, when this deck might peter out, uh, you know, when, uh, an aggressive deck might, uh, you know, draw cards, uh, or, or it, not draw cards, an aggressive deck might get to the point where uh, it's cast all of its, its spells in hand and it's just drawing a card off the top of the library and not really finding anything. Essentially, uh, I guess what I could say is this deck can run out of gas pretty quickly and this deck can grind out a longer game and eventually win so this deck either wins fast or loses in the late you know in the mid to late game and this deck can lose fast by losing to an aggressive deck like this uh, or it can last long enough to see itself become the victor thanks christopher nolan um lives long enough to see itself become the victor okay so in a game of magic there can be, uh, you know, two, three, four, um, but in uh, in this case, we're playing with two standard decks. Now, the word I just said, standard, refers to the format that we're playing. Um, so standard is uh, a collection of sets of the most recent sets to have come out, and right now, I think standard is what, like, six? It's like from Throne of Eldraine, Theros, I, I don't know, but... It's, it's basically the smallest format, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are dozens of formats out there, but, uh, you know, of, of formats that I'm familiar with, it's, it's pretty much the smallest pool of cards, and it's all the most recent cards to have come out. Over a certain period of time, it fluctuates, um, you know, as rotation and things happen, but uh, basically it's a very small set of cards that are allowed to be played in standard. So I'm playing a bunch of standard legal cards in these decks. And in a game of Magic... Um, in, a, in, in this kind of game of magic that I'm playing, in a 1v1 game of magic, there are two decks involved. Obviously, your opponent will have a deck, and you will have a deck. And uh, in the game, I mean, you can refer to it as your deck, but in the game, essentially, your deck of cards that is laying face down in front of you is called your library. And this is the deck of cards. Your library is the, the, uh, the pile of cards that you will be drawing from during the game uh, to find spells and enchantments and creatures that you'll be casting during the game. Uh, so both players start with their library face down and all 60 cards. So in a, in a standard deck can have more than 60 cards if you would like to. Um, and there's a lot of math and there's a lot there's a lot of reasons why 60 is, is optimal. I mean so you <clears throat> when you're building a deck you want to have 60 cards in your deck. Um, because 60 is the minimum amount that you can have, and it makes the most sense to have the minimum because it increases the chances that you draw the cards that you want. If you have a deck of cards of 240 and you're playing against somebody with 60, it is much more likely that they're going to find the spells that they need to win a lot faster because they're only looking through 60 as opposed to somebody who has a huge pile of 240. That isn't to say that somebody with a deck of 240 will always lose to somebody with a deck of 60. It's just variability. You're increases, you're increasing the variance that you don't find spells by every single card you include over 60. Um, so you can have 61 cards if you want, but just every single card that you add decreases the chances that you find the, you know, let's say you need to draw, you know, one card off the top of your deck to win the game. If you have 240 cards, the odds are you're probably not drawing that card. So, in any given deck of 60 cards, you can have four copies of any given card. That being
being said, there are some cards that include rules that say you can include more or less, um, but none of the decks that I'm playing have those, and they're pretty rare, to be, to be fair. The only cards that you can have multiple copies of, more than four, would be land cards. Now, land cards are cards that you use to cast your spells, and we'll be seeing those, uh, obviously, through the games that I play. Um, but land cards you can have any number of in your deck. land cards you can have any any color in your deck there are uh, some land cards that have uh, what is called dual colors where they they can cast uh, mana of any color that exists in the, or they can cast mana of two specific colors in the game as opposed to basic land cards can only cast uh, a single color so this deck is mono red meaning it is only playing the color red so there are no multiple color cards in this deck it is only red lands and red basic lands uh, and a few utility lands. So there are some lands in the game that can do more than just enter the battlefield and then be tapped to uh, create a color of mana for you to cast a spell. So a land card, again, gets played into the battlefield. And then what you do is you turn it, which is called tapping it, and it creates a, a color of mana or, or mana in general. So this mono red deck that only plays red would cast a red land card, tap it to create a red color mana, which you can then use to cast a red spell or a colorless spell. Um, this deck has some lands that can cast, uh, has some lands that can be tapped for uh, either black, green, or white. Um, so it has multiple it has triomes included in the deck. Triome meaning, uh, you know, there, there are multiple names, you know, dual land, triome. Uh, some lands have specific names. Um, uh, it also has lands that when they enter the battlefield can be one color or another, so you can choose at the time it's cast what color it is. But once it's laid down, it can only be tapped for that color. So, uh, when when two players, or when you're starting a game like I'm playing, you know, one versus one, and you've laid your decks face down, what both players do is they take the top seven cards of their uh, library, off the top of their library, so you take the top seven cards, uh, and in this case, you know, here I'll just, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So both players take the top seven cards of their library and put it into their hand. And I'm going to lay out all the cards here for you so you can see them all. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm going to lay them all face down. Or I'm sorry, I'm going to lay them all face up for you. Uh, but obviously in a game of magic, what you want to know is these cards are not face up normally. Uh, both players draw the seven cards, and they're looking at them themselves and not revealing it to their opponent. Uh, what we're doing right now is what, what's called playing with perfect information, meaning we're seeing all the information in the player's hands and what's on the battlefield. Uh, so everything is face up. Uh, again, this is not what is normally uh, what normally happens in a game of magic. Normally in a game of magic, both players draw these seven cards and do not reveal them to each other. Uh, and what we're doing right now is we're kind of in a phase of the game before the game has actually started where we've drawn seven cards. We're going to take a look at these cards and decide, you know, are, is this is this a set of seven cards that I would like to start the game with? So on the, uh, let's start with our opponent. Like in this case, I'm, I'm saying that Mono Red is my opponent and I'm playing with my Golgari, which is a, uh, a, a green and black, although there's a sprinkling of white for a specific removal spell, uh, my mid-range deck. So we'll just say aggro or mono red versus mid-range, and that's how we'll refer to, you know, the, the two kinds of decks. And my opponent is playing the mono red aggro deck, and I am playing the abs and Golgari, or the, the mid-range deck. So let's start with our opponent. Our opponent has drawn a hand of Fireblade Charger, which is a one mana, a one red mana spell. 
a snow-covered mountain, which is a land card that can be cast to create one red mana. A one mana uh, Tormentor's Helm, which is an artifact or equipment. A one red mana Fervent Champion, which is a creature like the Fireblade Charger. They're both uh, one red mana creatures. A Bone Crusher Giant, which is a three red mana creature, but it also has the ability to be cast as a two red mana spell. We'll get into that. Uh, they drew a second uh, mountain, or a second basic red land, uh, and they drew a very expensive uh, artifact or equipment, which is called Embercleave. Uh, it can be cast for six, uh, six mana, four colorless mana, and two red. But it typically isn't cast for that much, and you'll, we might get into into why, in a bit. But I'd say, as far as hands go, this is a pretty good hand for mono red. It's not great. We would like to see another land, um, but it's pretty good. Uh, just to let you know, so basic lands, so like the snow covered lands that you saw, the two snow covered lands, these snow covered mountains that can be tapped for red mana can also be tapped for colorless mana. So when we're talking about Embercleave, which is a card that can be cast for um, six mana, four colorless, and two red, that means the four colorless mana can also be pay paid for with snow-covered mountains. You can tap them for red mana, which, you know, mana of any color can also just be used for colorless mana. Uh, so colorless mana, essentially, you know, it's not like uh, you need colorless mana to pay for colorless mana. You can use red mana to pay for colorless. So anyway, uh, so this is a pretty good hand for mono red. Now let's take a look at the Golgari mid-range deck. And the hand is a little less good, but not horrible. So the Golgari mid-range um, deck has drawn a hand of Garuk, the Cursed Huntsman, which is a six mana planeswalker. Uh, planeswalker is kind of like a creature, but not really at all. We'll get into the ins and outs if we even get to cast this spell. Agonizing Remorse, which is a two-mana hand disruption spell. Indatha Trium, which is a three, a tricolor land, a land that can be played and then can produce one of three different colors. A Castle Locked Thwain, which is a utility land. It's a land that can be played. It can create black mana, but it also has the ability you can pay mana and draw cards with it later in the game uh, at a cost of your life total get into it, perhaps. Another tri Triome. Indatha Triome, another three-color land. A swamp and a forest. All things considered, this isn't a bad hand. It's, it is a little land-heavy, but it generates a lot of different colors of mana, so we, you know, as we draw cards, we might find things uh, that we can start casting. Agonizing Remorse is a decent early play, although it hurts us. If I knew that I was playing Mono Red Aggro, I probably wouldn't keep this because it's a little slow, and the one early spell that we have hurts us. This Agonizing Remorse, uh, you actually have to pay one life when you cast this. Um, so it hurts me to cast it, and against a deck that tries to attack your life total very quickly, that's not very good. Um, but I think I'm actually going to keep, like... You know, in, in a game of face-up magic, obviously I know this is a bad hand, but I'm going to try to play as if I didn't know my opponent was playing mono-red, because obviously they're playing their stuff face down. Um, and I'm just going to say, hey, you know, I have, you know, maybe I have one, two, three, four, I have five lands and a seven land hand. Maybe this is actually uh, what's called a mulligan. A mulligan is when you've decided, you look at your seven cards and you say, hey, you know, I don't really think that this is a great hand. I want to redraw. I want to draw again and, and see if uh, my next hand is better. When you mulligan, you get to put the hand that you had away. You shuffle your library. You redraw. You draw seven, but you have to put one card away. That is the cost for each mulligan. So if you mulligan two times, that's two cards you have to put away. Now your starting hand is only five cards. Um, so let's actually do that. You know, I think a, land of, a hand of five lands is pretty rough. So let's take these cards, we'll put them in the bottom. Let's try to get like a little bit of a reshuffle here. Uh, I'm gonna break the deck in half uh, because these have uh, covers on them. The deck is much, much too thick. 
to get like a successful shuffle. Um, so let's just break it down. Shuffle it up like that. So our next draw is also not that great. <laughs> our next draw only had one land, a Jungle Hollow, which is a dual land. The rest are pretty cheap spells, and they're not bad. <sighs> a one lander is typically you want between two to two to four lands in your opening hand. Three would be ideal. Um, just for the sake of the video, so I'm going to take keep this hand. It's not a good one, and I, I probably wouldn't normally. I just, here, I'm just gonna... Okay. I took a look at the top card. I just want to make sure that this deck doesn't get run over. Typically, you obviously wouldn't do that. Um, but this is a risky, risky hand to keep because it's only one land. Typically, I would say redo it, but I'm just, you know, I just, I, I want to get things underway here. Um, but anyway, so we'll keep this hand. Uh, it has some early removal in Blood Chief's Thirst and Mythos of Nethroi. Those are two removal spells. They, they kill creatures or uh, any Mythos of Nethroi is special because it can kill any non-land permanent or it can kill creatures. Blood Chief's Thirst can kill cheap creatures. Agonizing Remorse is early hand disruption. Scavenging Ooze is a uh, early creature you can play. And Maze Mind Dome is an early uh, kind of artifact that you can play to kind of manipulate your deck. So it's a decent hand. Uh, will it stack up against this mono red deck? Maybe, maybe not. Probably not. But we'll see. So both players have drawn. Let me, uh, I'm going to get my phone in here. Both, both players have drawn, and uh, typically this is actually done first, but uh, let's get uh, my life total counter here. So in a game of magic, both players start with 20 life. I will give them the color uh, red. And for us, we'll stay black. <clears throat> okay. So, nifty little app here. So both players start with 20 life. Um, and then we're just going to do a little roll of the dice here. And red has won, so red is going first, which is very good for red. Uh, red always would like to go first, so... Red has gone, red gets the, you know, red decide, or I guess the winner decides who gets to go first. Um, I'm actually going to put the life totals kind of over here. You're not going to see it because, you know, you're, as, as things develop, uh, you know, I'll, I'll show you what the life totals are and everything. But, so both players start with uh, 20 life. Red gets to go first. So uh, in this case, you know, every turn of the game, you can play one land at a time. So in this case, you know, the game has begun. We both kept you know, a specific hand. Uh, and red now gets to start. So red uh, would play a red mountain. Uh, the red mountain, just, you know, basic lands can come into play untapped, meaning they just enter the battlefield. And then you can immediately tap them for mana. So uh, red starts, uh, plays a basic mountain untapped because basic, basic lands can come in untapped. We're going to tap that for a red mana. Fireblade Charger. So Fireblade Charger is one red mana. So it's perfect that we have one basic mountain. We can get a creature out right away. So one red mana, one one. Uh, as long as Fireblade Charger is equipped, it has haste. We have no we have no equipment on the battlefield, so that doesn't matter. And then when Fireblade Charger dies, it deals uh, damage equal to its power to any target. So it is a one one, and a one one essentially means that it has one power and one toughness. Uh, we'll get into kind of the intricacies of what power and toughness mean later. Uh, but it is a one mana, one power, one toughness creature. So we tap the red mana, and we'll play the Fireblade Charger. Um, they now have 
nothing else they can do. They only have, you know, their only land has been tapped. Uh, there's nothing else that Red can do this turn. All right. So because Red was what's called on the play, meaning they got to play the game first or make their first, their play first, uh, my deck or the uh, mid-range deck is what's called on the draw, meaning because Red got to start first, we get to draw a card first. Red does not get to draw a card. When you start the game, you just, whatever your hand you have, you start playing it out, um, and your opponent gets to draw a card before their turn starts. Um, and typically, you know, as the game progresses, you know, when, once, you've, uh, once the person who has started the game makes their play, after that, every single turn, you open your turn with uh, a, a draw, or drawing a card off the top of your library. So that is what the mid-range deck is going to do right now. So I'm going to draw a card off the top of my library. I drew a land card, which I knew was there. It's I wasn't supposed to, but I, I, I looked because I wanted to make sure the game would hopefully go smoothly. So, so from now on, when each player starts, uh, you know, their turn, uh, they draw a card off the top of their library. So um, it is now, you know, it is now my turn. So what's called the upkeep. Uh, well, well, we'll get into that later. But I, uh, so, so I drew my card. So now I have, uh, you know, all these cards in hand, you know, the same ones that I started with. So we're going to start with a jungle hollow. Jungle hollow is a dual land that can be tapped for either uh, black or green. It enters the battlefield tapped, meaning unlike the red mountain that we played uh, for red it enters the battlefield tapped we can't tap it this turn for mana so it enters the battlefield tapped but we gain one life so the mid-range player is now up to 21 life which is kind of nice uh, but that's it that's my turn uh, i played the only land that i had in my hand i have no one mana plays uh, and this came into play tapped anyway so i wouldn't be able to play anything so the mid-range deck has made their play for the turn as you can tell, kind of the early plays in the in the uh, in the game kind of start um, somewhat early. Now that I'm looking at red, I think there was maybe a better one turn play, but it doesn't matter now. So I'm going to untap. <clears throat> okay, so this is actually a good time. Okay, so um, the mid range deck has finished its turn, so now we are turning the uh, the we're turning the um, the turn back over to red. So now what we're going to do is what's called the upkeep, and the upkeep is your uh, is the uh, you know the player whose turn it is. It's their uh, ability, or it's their um, kind of the initiative for them to untap their you know their land sources so that they can tap them this turn. So you untap all your land sources. Uh, that's the first thing you do is you untap all your land sources, and then you draw for your turn. So he has drawn another mountain, which is just fantastic. Um, so you start with the upkeep of untapping all the lands that were tapped your previous turn. You draw your card, and now your main phase has begun. So now you can start playing lands, casting spells, stuff like that. So let's do that. So we drew another mountain, so we're going to play that mountain onto the battlefield. So now we have two untapped mountains. This is two potential mana that we have on the battlefield. So I think what we'll... Um, you know, there's some intricacies as to what you should and shouldn't maybe do. You know, it, we have two red mana, so we can hold up this spell. So you can notice this Bone Crusher Giant is a three mana, four three. So it's a three mana, four, uh, four power, three toughness creature. But it also has this spell, Stomp, which is an instant. We'll, we'll get into that information, but it's a spell that you can cast for two mana. So, you know, maybe you want to cast that, but at this at this time, I wouldn't advise that. Um, basically, I think what this deck wants to be doing right now is developing its battlefield. So what we're going to do is we're going to tap uh, one red for a, uh, you know, let's, let. I, I don't think that this is the I ideal play, but um, I think it would be a fine play for now. Uh, and just for the sake of the game. So we're going to play our, our, and for the sake of teaching you how to play, we're going to play our Torment. We're going to tap one red mana and play our Tormentor's Helm. So Tormentor's Helm is a one red mana. So we, we tapped this one red snow source to play this and put it onto the battlefield. It's one red mana, our 
artifact. Artifacts are played off to the side. Um, it's an artifact equipment. And an, uh, an equipment is something that is attached to, or can be attached to a creature. So it's an artifact equipment. And it reads, equipped creature gets plus one, plus one. I'm sorry if uh, the camera doesn't focus. Equipped creature gets plus one, plus one. Whenever equipped creature becomes blocked, it deals one damage to defending player, and it caught and it has it says at the bottom equip one colorless mana, meaning you pay one colorless and you attach it to a creature you control, and you can equip only as a sorcery. So I guess now is a good time to explain instants and sorceries, which are two kind of main, two of the main uh, kind of spell speeds or spell types in the game. So uh, you know all. All the things you can do are spells, creatures are spells, and artifacts and equipment are spells. Um, and they can be cast at specific times. So in the case of Bone Crusher Giant, or the Stomp spell that I showed you before, this one, the two mana uh, damage, you know, the, it's uh, damage can't be prevented this turn. Stomp deals two damage to any target. So that's, you can see there, it also says Instant Adventure. Adventure, just forget about that, it doesn't matter right now. But what an instant means is it can be played pretty much at any time during the game. So when you're, let's say, and again, this isn't the board, well, you know, I'm not going to confuse you with it right now, but uh, I could play that, the deal two damage on my opponent's turn at specific points um, if I have the untapped mana. So if red taps both of their mana right now, they cannot play this spell on their opponent's turn because they have no untapped mana. But if I left both of these untapped and just passed the turn back to my opponent as they were casting spells, I could then cast Bone Crusher Giant. A sorcery is something that can only be played during main phases. So uh, during that main phase that I was talking about where I could play a land or something, I could have played this land and then played, uh, well, I guess a, a better example is, so I'm casting uh, Tormentor's Helm off to the side. So now, this is, I'm still at sorcery speed. I'm on my main phase. And what I'm going to do is tap this mana for one red mana that can be used as colorless mana. And I'm going to colorlessly use that mana to and attach this artifact or equipment to the Fireblade Charger. So the Fireblade Charger is now a 2-2. Remember, it was a 1-1 one, one when we cast it. But Tormentor's Helm gives uh, the equipped creature plus one, plus one. So Fireblade Charger is now a 2-2, two, two. and whenever it is blocked, it deals one damage to my opponent, and then remember, Fireblade Charger, when it dies, it deals damage equal to uh, its power, so when this dies, it now will deal two damage to my opponent, uh, and I equipped it on my main phase, which is at sorcery speed, so that was a, f that was a fine equip, um, and now, uh, you know, all my mana is tapped, there's not much left I can do, so we're moving on to what's called the combat phase, uh, where, you know, creatures can fight, well not fight, creatures can attack and block and do all that, so um, I'm going to put Red's hand back down so I can show you how combat works, so basically, so now uh, Fireblade Charger can now attack um, my opponent. The reason that Fireblade Char Charger couldn't, the turn that we cast it, is uh, unless it says otherwise creatures cannot attack the turn they are played because they have something called summoning sickness. Uh, the only way, well, there might be a few ways, but uh, there's a specific keyword called haste that we'll be seeing next turn for red uh, that allows creatures to attack on the turn that they're played. So haste would allow a creature to attack the turn it's played. Um, and you know what, now that I'm realizing it, I could have done this in a different order, but it doesn't matter. I'm here to teach. I'm not here to play perfectly. Um, so Fireblade Charger couldn't attack last turn, so he didn't, but he can this turn because his summoning sickness is gone, and now, you know, he's equipped with Tormentor's Helm, but that doesn't really matter. He didn't need to be equipped with Tormentor's Helm to attack. He, he could have attacked without it, but he would have attacked for one. The reason we attached it is now we can attack for two. So Fireblade Charger, uh, in this, you know, in this, uh, um, attack phase, in this combat phase, uh, the red player decides he wants to attack with his Fireblade Charger, his 2-2 on the battlefield. Um, the mid-range player doesn't have anything on the battlefield, so we can't block, we can't do anything, so the mid-range player would take 2 damage. We didn't block 
so it's not dealing an additional damage. And Fireblade Charger is not dead, so it's not dealing uh, two damage, which is its power uh, to me. So that's it. So now he is attacked. We move on from the uh, uh, combat phase to now the red player's end phase. So he could play, you know, if he had untapped mana, he might be able to play something else. He doesn't have any untapped mana. He has no other plays. He can now pass the turn back over to uh, the mid-range player. So now the mid-range player, it's now his turn or my turn to do the, uh, what's called the upkeep. So untap the land. And we will draw for our turn. And now it is, uh, it is now the mid-range player's uh, main phase. Range player drew a Blood Chief's Thirst, <coughs> which is not bad. Um, so I think we're going to play the land that we drew last turn. So we have two untapped lands, and then I'm I'm going to be honest. You know, with perfect information, I know what's coming, and a two-two isn't really something that we need to worry about right now. So I'm just trying to decide what the mid-range player would want to do. So we can use one of our Blood Chief's Thirsts <coughs> to remove the Fireblade Charger. But remember, the mid-range player also has to keep uh, keep in their head that when they kill this Fireblade Charger, it will deal two damage to them. So they're paying one mana to kill a creature, but also take two damage. It's a tough trade-off, but uh, we could also tap two mana to play a Maze Mind Dome, which is an, another kind of artifact. It's not an equipment so it doesn't get a attached to a creature. This artifact is kind of a utility artifact. We'd be using it, um, as you can read here, so once you play it, you can tap it to add a page counter on it to scry one. Now scrying, essentially what a scry means is you, you, you when you scry, uh, and the number associated with it is the amount of cards you can look on the top of your library, decide if you want it on the top of your library, or if you want to put it on the bottom library. So if we played this, we could immediately tap it and look at the top card of our library, decide if we want it to be there or if we want to put it on the bottom. Um, and considering we're kind of desperate for lands, it might be the best play. And I think it's my, it might be what we do. Uh, Maze Mind Dome also has some other abilities. You can pay two mana, tap it, and draw a card. Uh, it also adds a page counter on it, and then when there are four or more page counters on Maze Mind Dome, exile it. If you do, ga you gain four life. So essentially, uh, you can use this, you can tap this up to four times, and on the fourth time, it is exiled and you gain four life. So I think that's what we're going to do. So we're going to tap... Oh, uh, and actually, this, this land um, is a branch loft pathway. It's double-sided. It can be tapped for white on the other side, and I think we're going to play it. Uh, I think we're going to play this as white mana, because we might need it later. So we're playing that as white mana, and we're going to tap both of them, for it doesn't matter any color, because Maze Mind Dome is color two colorless mana. So we've tapped these both for any color of mana, it doesn't matter. We're playing Maze Mind Dome. I could tap Maze Mind Dome right now to look at the top card of my library for that scry that we were talking about. Um, but that can be done at instant speed, so this can be done on my opponent's turn. And it doesn't cost mana, because as you can see, the symbol on the card is just an arrow pointing like it's turning. That means tap, so we can just tap this card at any time. We don't pay mana. To draw a card, we do need to pay the two colorless, as you can see there. There we go. So you pay two mana, two colorless mana, tap it at instant speed to draw a card, or you can pay no mana, tap it, and scry one. Either way, you're putting a page counter on it, and I think that's what we're going to do. Um, so we are tapped out. We tap both of our mana. We go to combat. We have nothing on the battlefield. doesn't matter. We go to our end step, or our end phase. We have no mana. We have no nothing. We pass the turn back over to our opponent. Alright, so it is now back to the red player's turn. So now they untap all of their 
untapped stuff that they tapped on their turn. So Fireblade Charger becomes untapped again, and his lands are now untapped. And now, for the red player, we will draw for turn. Oh my god. Oh my god. This is, this is not good. Okay, <clears throat> so it is now the red player's main phase again. Um, so on this main phase, we're going to play a <sighs> snow-covered land. Um, you know what? God. This is bad for mid-range. Okay, so we're going to tap two red mana. And we're going to play two one red mana spells. We're going to play two fervent champion. Fervent champion is a one red mana. One one. Uh, with first strike and haste. So, haste, if you'll recall, means that Fervent Champion does not have summoning sickness. So, unlike the Fireblade Charger on our first turn, when Fireblade Charger couldn't attack, I think I failed to mention that, but you get it now. F Fervent Champion, we're playing two of them onto the battlefield right now. And Fervent Champion, the, both of these Fervent Champions can attack immediately. I've, obviously, it's still the main phase, so we're not in combat yet, we're not deciding to attack, but... If you take a look at our hand, we don't really, uh, neither of these spells can be played that right now. Uh, Bonecrusher Giant is 3 or 2 mana, and Embercleave is tr just too expensive, just trust me when I say that, uh, to cast right now, uh, or I think during combat. So we have no other thing, we have no other spells to, to cast right now during our first main phase. Uh, so let's move to combat. Um, so in combat, again, the mid-range player has no no defenses right now. It's only turn, you know. It's only turn. It was only just turn two for him. Uh, so now the uh, red player now is going to decide to attack with everything. You know, if your opponent has no blockers, you go ahead and attack. So fireblade charger, and both fervent champions because remember they do not have summoning sickness because they had haste, can both attack. Now I'm going to bring something to your attention, which is particularly awful for the mid range player. So on the fervent champion card. You can read whenever Fervent Champion attacks. Uh, another target attacking knight you control gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. Uh, and then the rest is just about equip abilities. We won't get into that until maybe later in the game, but this might end pretty quickly. So, because if you read the card, there's just under the art of all creature cards, it'll give you kind of, or actually, I guess, underneath all cards, it'll give you information about so Fervent Champion is a creature, uh, and he's a human knight. So any other attacking knight you control gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. So because we have two Fervent Champions attacking that are both knights, both of them are going to get plus one, plus one. So instead of being a one, one, both of these are now two ones because they're both attacking and they both have that ability. So essentially... <laughs> range player is now looking at four damage that he cannot block. So let's take the damage. One, two, three, four. Uh, and we are now uh, at a place where the red player has taken no damage and the mid-range player is taken five. Um, another keyword to notice here is first strike. You'll see right underneath where it says creature human knight. It says first strike and haste. Haste being the ability for the fervent champion to come in and attack immediately as, as opposed to having summoning sickness, preventing it from attacking the turn it's played and having to wait one turn. First strike is something that we may or may not have to get into. Alright, so the combat phase is over. Uh, we move on to the next phase, the end phase of the um, or the uh, the, the, not the end phase, the um, second main phase of the red player. So after combat, you get another chance to spend mana or do something at sorcery speed. He has no other play, so he's not going to do anything. And we are now on what is called his end step. So on his end step, just before the turn has come back to me, the mid-range player, I'm going to activate the scry ability of my maze mind dome. So just tapping it, again, remember, scry is the ability to look at the top card of your library decide whether or not you want to keep that card on top of your library or put it on the bottom. Uh, and a 
essentially what that's doing is allowing me to manipulate my library. Uh, you know, every it might not sound like that great of an ability, but it truly is. What it allows you to do is kind of, you know, spells. You know, if I if I see like a twelve, you know, a twelve mana spell, if I see like a six mana spell on top of my library, I can't even cast it. I only have two lands on the battlefield. I need something that I can play. I need either a land or something that I can play with three mana to try to slow this down because this is getting out of control. I, you know, he's just played a bunch of really cheap creatures. He's attacking me for four damage a turn. I need something to have an impact. I need it now. So I'm tapping this to look at this top card, and this is very crucial. So we're, let's take a look. We're tapping that, and it's a land, and I'm going to keep that because I need lands. I need to start playing things or killing things. So we're going to keep that. So we're keeping that on top of the library. Now, let's say that was, again, a six mana spell. I would take a look at that, and I would immediately put that on the bottom of my library because I can't play it. So what then would happen is uh, the turn would then come back, you know, to my turn. Everything would untap. I could tap this again if I wanted to. I probably wouldn't, but I could untap everything. And before I draw, I could tap this and scry again to look for a land. Uh, you know, if this wasn't a land, I probably would, but because it's a land, I don't have to. Uh, essentially the next card on top of my library would be brand new. It wouldn't be that card I didn't want. That would be on the bottom of my library. So that's kind of the benefit of scrying. But anyway, we found what we wanted. We're keeping it on top. The end step is now over, and the turn now comes to the mid-range player. So if you remember, again, we are now at the upkeep phase, which means we untap everything. So let me pick up my hand here. Untap our maze mind tome. Untap our two lands. And we will draw for turn, which, as we know, is the land. And now we got some stuff developing here. <coughs> so I think, okay, so uh, we, we now drew for turn. So now it is the mid-range player's first main phase. So we will play that land that we just found onto the battlefield. Um, and I think what, I think what we're going to have to do So let's take a look at the mid-range player's hand. It is now our main phase. This is a very important part of the game. We're facing down four damage every turn, which is unacceptable. Four damage every turn ends a game very quickly. Uh, obviously, that's, you know, several turns in a row. But, you know, if we don't do anything, this game's over in, you know, 4, 8, 12, 16, um, 20, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Sixteen, twenty, five turns, right? Am I, am I, am I stupid? Yeah. Well, anyway, it's done in in, in a certain amount of turns, um, and we can't let that happen. Although we did gain one life, so that gives us one extra turn, right? We were at twenty-one, so we're at fifteen. So yeah, we would. It doesn't matter. You can't be taking four damage each turn and not have anything you can do. So. We should start interacting with our opponent. We should start removing things. And we have what is called removal spells. So as you can see, we have a card. We have two copies of Blood Chief's Thirst. So Blood Chief's Thirst is a one black mana sorcery. Destroy target creature or planeswalker with converted mana cost to two or less. If the spell was kicked, which we'll get into that later, it doesn't matter. Forget, forget that kicked part. But essentially, one mana kills something that's converted mana cost two or less. Converted mana cost being the uh, the casting cost or the mana value of the spell. So Fervent Champion and Fireblade Charger, these one red mana spells, are one converted mana cost or one mana value. If they were one in a colorless or two red, that's two converted mana cost. So uh, we can kill these with this if we want to. And we have two of these, so we could kill two of these things. We also have Mythos of Nethroi, which is a three mana removal spell. It reads, destroy target non-land permanent. Uh, and then there's a spe there's a special case, you know, if, if it's casting, if we cast a certain color of mana, we can uh, destroy any non-land permanent. Uh, so 
get to destroy a creature if you pay like black and two colorless or if you play black green white you can destroy any non-land permanent but that's a little paying just a basic lesson here paying three mana to kill one one mana creature not a good exchange paying one mana twice to kill two one mana creatures is okay so now we have to decide what we want to do and then we have another we have another thing in our hand scavenging ooze scavenging ooze is a one uh, two converted mana cost so a scavenging ooze could be killed by a blood chief service but obviously we don't want to be killing our own creatures but i'm just trying to get you used to you know converted mana cost mana value is what they mean and you know referring to them but scavenging ooze is a two converted mana cost green and one colorless creature uh, and he's a two two and he has an ability pay one green mana exile target card from a graveyard if it was a creature card put a plus one plus one counter on scavenging ooze and you gain one life so having experience playing standard i know that red plays bone crusher giant which has that remember that two damage spell thing which could kill my scavenging ooze so i'm not very tempted to play scavenging ooze and remember uh so remember fireblade charger is a 2-2 right now and my scavenging ooze is also a 2-2 meaning if they came into combat with each other and i decided to block we'll kind of get into this more uh a little bit later kind of attacking and blocking but basically i don't want him on the battlefield because you know he matches their best creature so it's you know maybe not the best exchange for me he's the only creature i have and they have plenty so i don't really want to play him yet i think the best thing that the mid-range player could do right now is remove some of the threats on the battlefield and kind of give them a little bit more time to breathe a little bit more time to activate this dome and find the things they need to kind of stabilize the game so what i think on again we're still on mid-range's main phase i'm just thinking through these turns so what i think mid-range is going to do is i'm going to tap the swamp that we just found on top of our library for a black mana and i'm going to cast blood chief's thirst on and i'm going to choose the fireblade charger uh, the reason i'm choosing the fireblade charger here is because i want to take the two damage it can deal me now as opposed to being too late in the game to kill this if you understand my meaning so let's say that mid-range is down to two life i literally couldn't kill the fir the fireblade charger or block it and let it die because it would kill me because when remember when it dies it deals damage equal to its power and it's currently a two two um and if i use the other blood chief's thirst on a fervent champion then all of a sudden all they have is a one red mana one one who doesn't get pumped because the other knight is off the battlefield so their little secondary ability where other attacking knights get plus one plus zero there are no other attacking knights if i kill one of them so they're left with a one red mana one one to attack me and you know I, I can take one damage 15 more times and still be in well 14 more times and still be in the game so if 14 more turns if that's all they play obviously it's not going to be but it buys me more time i'd rather again i'd rather take the two damage now uh, rather than wait too long and leave this on the battlefield i think that's probably the best move so i'm going to play blood cheese thirst kill the fireblade charger so when this happens essentially things get put on the stack which i don't know if the stack is the right thing to really kind of explain right now but it's a lot more difficult on paper to kind of keep up with the stack but the, the the blood chief's thirst is now a spell on the stack meaning it is in play and i'm choosing to target the fireblade charger so this is kind of where i can explain instant speed so blood chief's thirst is on the stack targeting fireblade charger it hasn't resolved yet there's one red mana open for the red player if they had some kind of interactive spell right now um, you know they could maybe tap that mana and do something to kind of change what's happening they don't have it and red doesn't really have the ability to do something like that um, but you know like let's say they had two red mana open right now they could tap two red mana and play that bone crusher giant deal two damage if they wanted to but they can't because uh, that's what instant speed means you know as spells get cast and are put on the stack meaning i'm casting this spell imagine there's like a board above this board i'm stacking this on top of it saying this is what's happening right now do you have anything you can do and they would stack that on top of it and you just keeps you could you know at instant speed keep stacking things on top of each other and make trigger and upon trigger upon trigger happen but there's really nothing that can be done right now 
because nobody has enough mana and there aren't enough instants and sorceries in each other's hands. So I'm so I'm putting this on the stack saying I'm playing my Blood Chief's Thirst, my one black mana removal spell to kill your Fireblade Charger. And that's all that can really happen right now. So Blood Chief's Thirst now resolves killing the Fireblade Charger. So when a spell resolves like this, my, my Blood Chief's Thirst, my removal spell now goes to what's called the Graveyard. Uh, the Graveyard is kind of a place for creatures that have died or for spells that have been cast and resolved. Um, and they can be accessed again if, you know, if you have a deck that interacts with its Graveyard, but these don't really. So for now, um, you know, they will just kind of put it in a Graveyard. Uh, I'm going to have to put the Graveyards off camera. I'll put them up here, actually. So this is the graveyard for mid-range. Uh, we killed the Fireblade Charger. So that spell is, you know, Blood Chief's Thirst is resolved. The Fireblade Charger is now dead. It had two toughness when it died, so it deals two damage to the mid-range player. The, the Fireblade Charger is now in the graveyard. And the Tormentor's Helm, which is equipment, equipment, you, know, you can't kill equipment. So the Fireblade Charger died, it did the two damage, and the Tormentor's Helm now gets put off to the side. Remember I said, you know, equipment gets placed off to the side, and then when it's equipped, it gets attached to the creatures. So, uh, I'm putting that off to the side. Uh, I'm, his, his red's hand is over there, too, so try not to get confused. Or I'll move it up here. But Tormentor's Helm is put off to the side. It doesn't automatically get equipped. We have to re-equip it, so we have to, remember, uh, pay that one colorless mana if we want to re-equip it to Fervent Champion. Although, <laughs> Jesus, um, Fervent Champion has an ability that says equip abilities you activate the target for Fin champion costs three less to activate three colorless mana less so tormentor's helm is a free equip on our fervin champion and i'm pretty oh it can only be attached as a sorcery so we cannot reattach it to one of these fervin champions right now it can sit over here and we have to wait until again remember it's uh the players that mono red or red players main phase or either of their main phases, they can attach it, but they can't do it right now because it has to be done at sorcery speed. It cannot be done at instant speed, like we were talking about. So we cast the one Blood Chief's Thirst, which is now in the mo uh, mid-range player's graveyard. Fireblade Charger's in the graveyard. We took the two damage. All of that has resolved. We are still on my main phase. Nothing has changed. I still have mana that I can play for spells. Um, and so on my next, you know, the next action I'm going to take during this main first main phase is tap this jungle hollow, this dual black green land, and I'm going to tap it for black mana so I can cast the second blood chief's thirst. And I'm, it's getting, again, remember, placed on the stack. I'm saying my blood chief's thirst is now targeting this fervent champion. Um, and again, you know, at instant speed, if there was something that could be done, you know, you, you could start playing things and playing things and playing things, but it can't be. And uh, Blood Chief's Thirst is a sorcery, so it's not an instant. But other instants could be played at instant speed right now. But again, there are no instants. Nothing can really be done. So this sorcery speed card is being played, targeting Fervent Champion. There's nothing that can be done. It resolves Blood Chief's Thirst. Blood Chief's Thirst, the removal spell, goes to the graveyard. And the one Fervent Champion that got targeted by it also goes to the graveyard. So now mid-range player. Uh, did I draw for turn? Yes, I did. I drew those. Okay, I'm just trying to make sure I remembered everything. Okay, so now mid-range player has one open mana, but nothing to really do with it. So we go to combat. I have nothing on the battlefield. I can't attack. So now we move from combat to my end phase. I have nothing really I could do. I could activate the Maze Mind Dome now, but I'm going to wait for it. Remember, we've activated the Maze Mind Dome once already. Um, and what would actually be good right now is if I had some dye so I could actually represent counters on it. That's something I should have thought of. Here, I have an idea. It's a little card, um, and it, yeah, 
so we're just going to be paying attention to that top right number. It says 1. So we know that Maze Mind Tome has 1 activation on it. And remember, when it gets to 4, uh, it exiles and we gain 4 life, but it's gone. We can't use it anymore. and 
and I'm going to look at the top card of my library again. It is a land card, and it is a pretty good one. Uh, it is a Castle Locked Thwain, which is a utility land. Uh, it enters the battlefield tapped unless we control a swamp. We do control a swamp. Um, tap it to add one black mana, or you can pay uh, one and two black to tap it and tap it to draw a card and then lose life equal to the number of cards in your hand. We're probably not going to be doing that for a while. Um, but it is a playable land that comes in untapped. So I think that's a very good thing to keep. So uh, so we've activated that. Uh, we've scryed. We're keeping it on top. So now we draw. So we drew the land that we wanted. Or we drew the card that was on top of our library that we wanted. So I'm going to play that swamp, that castle lock, the lane, uh, onto the battlefield. Shoot. I wish we had more forests. So, <clears throat> so this this could be interesting. I wanted to do something to kind of show a mistake Red could make, but I, I guess I'm gonna do something that's gonna show mid range player making a mistake. So I don't have much playables, and I know Scavenger Goose would be a tough play right now. Scavenger Goose would be a great play right now if I had more green mana, because Scavenger Goose. Let's take a look at him. Has the inability, so he's a he's a two mana two two, and I know that red plays a card that deals two damage. So that's a hard play to make, but there's a way you could avoid it. For one green mana, exile target card from a graveyard, of which we know there are plenty. If it was a creature card, put a plus one, plus one counter on Scavenger Goose and you gain one life. So we could get rid of the Fervent Champion or the Fireblade Charger in red's graveyard and get plus one, plus one counters directly on ooze at instant speed. So mana abilities can be done at instant speed. So that's a one green mana ability. So we would tap one green mana, and uh, then we could essentially take exile these from the graveyard uh, and add plus one plus one counters to scavenging use at instant speed. So we play this. If they target it with a bone crusher giant or with that two two damage spell that's on the bone crusher giant card, if they targeted it, we could just tap another green. You know send one of these guys to exile, I'll explain what that means, but essentially take them out of the graveyard to add a plus one, plus one counter, gain life with scavenging ooze, and then all of a sudden, remember a plus one, plus one, well, a plus one, plus one counter means that we are adding one power and one toughness to scavenging ooze, so it becomes a three, three, two damage, now it does nothing, it doesn't kill him. So I guess we need to kind of explain what's going on there, that's, that's a lot going on, so and this is all, if I had it, the reason I'm saying it's not a good play is because I don't have two green mana, so I couldn't, I couldn't activate that ability. So, let's just say I did have green mana. I'm thinking I should have played this as green mana, but I didn't. It's too bad. I wanted to keep this as white mana because of the Mythos of Nethroi, but hindsight. Let's say I had, let's say that this Castle Lockthwain came in as if, let's say this was a forest. I could tap green mana and the white mana play the scavenger news. He's now on the battlefield, right? At instant speed, Bone Crusher Giant could target the scavenger news, saying he's going to deal two damage to him, which would kill him. So when a creature is dealt damage, especially kind of like the kind of way that Bone Crusher Giant deals damage, if you want to read it, damage can't be prevented. He deals two damage to any target. When a creature is dealt damage, either in combat or, you know, outside of combat, like Bone Crusher Giant, which is kind of spell being cast outside of um, combat, uh, that damage is dealt to the creature's toughness. So scavenging ooze is a 2-2, two, two, a 2 power 2 toughness. So its toughness would be, it would be reduced from 2 to 0, and when a creature's toughness is 0, it dies and goes to the graveyard. So if he, if he targeted it with the Bone Crusher Giant and said, I deal 2 damage to scavenging ooze, I would just have to tap one forest, use that mana ability, take one of the cards out of the graveyard, and add the plus one, plus one counter to Scavenger Goose, making it 3-3, three, three, meaning that Bone Crusher Giant would deal two damage to his now three toughness, so he would be a 3-1. He would need to deal one additional damage to kill Scavenger Goose at that point, which he doesn't have and couldn't do. But this is all kind of theoretical, and we don't have the other mana, so it would be a mistake to play uh, scavenger goose right now. Um, now, another thing I said which might be confusing is scavenger goose's ability. Uh, 
exile, exile target card from a graveyard. What does exile mean? What is that? So if I played Scavenge News, and if I activated its mana, its one green mana ability, or its one forest mana ability, I would exile a card from a graveyard. So there are multiple kind of zones of play. There's the battlefield, there's your library, the graveyard, and finally exile. So a graveyard, you know, when things die, they go to the graveyard. When a creature dies, it goes to the graveyard, unless indicated otherwise. When a creature dies, it goes to the graveyard. When a creature is exiled, uh, creatures can be, you know, you can get creatures. There are cards that get creatures out of a graveyard. There are cards that put creatures in the graveyard. There are ways to interact with the graveyard and get things out of it, get them on, back on the battlefield into your hand and stuff like that. Uh, Scavenger Goose, for example, can target a graveyard. And, you know, um, when things are in exile, that's it. They're gone. You can't, they cannot be accessed ever again in the game. So when Scavenger Goose targets these cards in Red's graveyard, uh, they would just, they're gone. They're out of his graveyard. There's no way he could get them back. Admittedly, in the mono red deck, there's no way he could in general. So once they're in the graveyard in this deck, they're just in the graveyard. He can't get them back out. But if he did play, uh, if he did play a card or something that said, return target creature from your graveyard to your hand or the battlefield, if he did have that, and I used my scavenging use to get rid of these, he then couldn't target them in his graveyard. They're gone. They're in exile now. So that's what exile means. And let's also just say on Bone Crusher Giant, where it says deal two damage to any target, let's say it also said if a creature would die this way, exile it instead. That means if Bone Crusher Giant targeted my ooze and my ooze didn't, you know, use its mana ability, it just took the two damage, it reduced its toughness from two to zero, and that kind of text was on the card. It said, you know, if a creature would die this way, exile it, or if it says exile on any specific card, that means instead of going to the graveyard, it just goes to exile, and that card is just gone. But again, none of that is really in the game, and we're all kind of in a hypothetical space right now. I'm just trying to teach at this point. So we're on mid-range's main phase, and I know that red plays Bone Crusher Giant, so I don't want to play Ooze unless I know I can use Ooze's ability to prevent Bone Crusher Giant from killing it. So I don't want to play Ooze. Mythos of Nethroi is also kind of a tough play, too, because we don't want to be spending. Remember, Mythos of Nethroi is our three-mana removal spell. Um, we don't really want to be targeting either the Tormentor's Helm as a non-target, uh, as a non, uh, non-land permanent, and we don't really want to be targeting the Fervent Champion either. Um, because we don't want to spend a three-mana to kill a one-mana artifact or a one-mana creature. We can't target both. It says destroy target, non-land permanent, uh, or, you know, we, it's not, it's not something that targets multiple things, it's just one or the other. We would either kill the Furfin Champion, or we would destroy the tor- Tormentor's Helm. And, you know, we don't want to spend three mana to just to dis- kill a one mana creature, or destroy a one mana artifact. So what do we do? We have one playable spell in our hand, Agonizing Remorse. Uh, Agonizing Remorse is a sorcery, so we can play it during our main phase. Target opponent reveals their hand. You choose a non-land card from it, or a card from their graveyard. Exile that card. You lose one life. It's not a great card to be playing against a deck like this. We don't want to lose one life. That puts us at ten. And, you know, that's five more turns of their 2-2 two, two Fervent Champion to kill us. And if they have more cards in their hand that deal damage to my face, like their Bone Crusher Giant and stuff like that, you know, that just reduces our clock that much more, you know, the time that we have left in the game. It could, you know, the upside is, this could get their best card, which is Embercleave, which they have. And it's kind of the only play that we have right now. And we do have to keep in mind, we have three triggers on the Maze Mind Dump, so we're getting four life back kind of soon. So I think, in this case, the black player, the black player, the uh, mid-range player, would use the black mana that they have available to them to cast this spell. It's not great, uh, but it's something. You know, it's a play of, you can't do nothing. Uh, so we cast, uh, on our first main phase, Agonizing Remorse, which, you know, again, they would reveal their hand, which would, oh, well, actually, so this is a great opportunity. Um, so, Agonizing Remorse gets put on what we call the stack, remember? So, Agonizing Remorse is out there. It hasn't resolved yet. They haven't revealed their hand. Nothing has happened. So, we've revealed that we want this done. They don't have to reveal their hand yet, because remember, they have three.
three mana open, and they have a two mana instant available to them in Stomp, this adventure segment on the Bone Crusher Giant. Uh, I'll kind of explain what this all kind of means in a second, but he can cast this for two mana. So with Agonizing Remorse on the stack before it is resolved, before we actually take action on the Agonizing Remorse and make them reveal their hand so we can make them uh, discard a card, uh, or actually exile a card. This exiles a card. So before this resolves, the red player decides, you know what, they're going to take a look at my hand, and they're either going to take the Ember Cleave or the Bone Crusher Giant. Uh, I'll let them take the Ember Cleave. Fuck it. I'm going to tap two red mana and cast the adventure portion of Bone Crusher Giant. So they're casting this, and they're going to just straight up target my life total or the mid-range player's life total. So he's saying, tap two mana, play Bone Crusher Giant out of my hand to deal two damage to you. So mid-range player is now at nine and does not since this resolved before this resolved. So the Bone Crusher Giant comes out and is now put on the top of the stack of cards that is going to be resolving during this main phase. The, um, the mid-range player doesn't have anything he can do with two mana, so, or at instant speed at least. Creatures cannot be played at instant speed. So the Bone Crusher Giant has been played and is targeting the mid-range player's face. I, I already took the life total off, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, but the Bone Crusher Giant is targeting my, you know, the mid-range player's face. There's nothing I can do about it, so the damage would be taken. We already did it. I should have waited, but the Bone Crusher Giant's targeting my face. Damage is done. There's nothing I can do about it, so uh, that happens. And here's the thing. So, you know, different sets of magic cards have these different mechanics and abilities, and essentially for this what do adventures do is once the adventure spell has been cast, um, then the card goes into exile, but not really. It's an exile where the, the creature portion of the card can be played from. So this card would, you know, the, the two damage would resolve. Bone Crusher Giant goes into exile, but not really. He essentially just kind of gets set aside and can be played later. So we're going to set Bone Crusher Giant aside. He can still be played as a creature instant portion is done. He cast the instant portion, and now all he has left is the creature portion. So that resolved, and now Agonizing Remorse is still in the stack, and Agonizing Remorse would now resolve. So he reveals his hand, and it's Embercleave in his hand, which is a really good card, and we're happy to get it. But we do lose one life, uh, as it says here. So uh, Embercleave would go into exile, although it, it goes into exile with the Bone Crusher Giant, but the Bone Crusher Giant can still be played because that's just part of the mechanism of an adventure. But Ember Cleave cannot be replayed. That goes into exile. It is now gone forever. So our mono red player has a pretty empty hand. Kind of. Because Bone Crusher Giant isn't in their hand per se, but he's still playable too for them. So he's kind of still in a version of their hand that doesn't exist. It's weird. Uh, forget it. But So Agonizing Remorse resolved and go now goes into the graveyard. We lost the life. We have no real playable, um, you know, we have no real plays right now, so that's kind of it. Uh, we could play the, sca well, actually, wait, we could play the Scavenging Ooze, but that doesn't really do much for us at this time, so I'd say we should just probably hang on to it. We could play it and start attacking, or maybe just, like, block, but, like, we have, what, we have five turns of the Fervent Champion attacking, assuming they don't draw anything else off the top of their library, so I'm going to say we hang on to the Scavenging Ooze for now. could be a great way to stabilize later in the game. We could hold on to our Mythos of Nethroi if they draw something great off the top of their library, but we don't really have much mana to work with right now, so that's kind of it. Um, that's the end of the main phase. We move to combat. Mid-range player has nothing. Move on to the end step. We have nothing. Move uh, And, yeah. And that's it. Now we pass turn. The red player has no cards in hand. They have two cards in the graveyard. Bone Crusher Giant and Ember Cleaver in exile. Bone Crusher Giant can still be played, remember. Um, but, you know, there's nothing they can do really right now. So we pass the turn back to the red player. So they go to upkeep where they untap all of their goodies. And now they draw for turn. And they only have one card. This is, this is it. This is their hand. 
fucking Christ. He drew a great card. Okay, so he drew a Rimrock Knight. Rimrock Knight is another one of these adventure cards where he has an instant spell that can be played at instant speed. Um, and he also is a two mana, three one creature. So he's three power and one toughness, which is low toughness, but. Oh man, this is not going well for the mid range player. Red is really getting uh, a lot out of this. So. In his hand is Rimrock Knight. Um, so. You know, there's not much you would really want to do right now. So, Rimrock Knight's adventure instant spell is, if you take a look here, it's called Boulder Rush. It's a one red mana target creature. gets plus two, plus zero until end of turn. Um, so, it deals a lot of damage. Or, it could help a creature deal a lot of damage. Uh, and that's at instant speed. So, it can be played during combat as kind of like a trick uh, to kill an opponent's creature or something like that. So I think what we would do if we were the red player is not tap any of our mana during our first main phase, go right to combat. We would attack with the Fervent Champion. The uh, mid-range player has no real play that they can make at this, at this time. So what the red player would do during combat uh, is activate one red mana and play the adventure side of Rimrock Knight to make the Fervent Champion a 4-2. It's a 2-2 two, two right now. Yeah, so it would be a 4-2. So we would take 4 damage. We are now down to 4. That would be it for combat. And then now we are on Red's second main phase. And Rimrock Knight, remember, with adventure cards, you don't really need to remember this. It's not going to be, you know, it's not always going to be true. But with, with adventure cards, Rimrock Knight goes to exile but can be played from there. But we have 3 red mana open. And we have Bone Crusher Giant, which is a three red mana spell. So, in this instance, uh, like when you have mana open, it's better always to try, not always, but sometimes it's better to use all of it. If you have three mana available, try to use a relevant spell that it costs three mana rather than uh, leaving mana open because it's just wasted mana that could have been something else. So, you could play. Rimrock Knight for two mana, put it on the battlefield and have one mana open. But in this instance, I think it's better for red to just tap all of their red mana to cast the three mana Bone Crusher Giant. So they are now tapped out. They cast Bone Crusher Giant. And remember, we could have cast Bone Crusher Giant before combat, but Bone Crusher Giant doesn't have haste like the Fervent Champion does, so he enters with Summoning Sickness. So if we cast him before combat, it really wouldn't have made a difference. We would have had the one mana open to play with the Rimrock Knight, so it doesn't really matter when we cast him. Um, but neither here nor there. He is now cast and on the battlefield. And now the mid-range player is looking at a lot of damage next turn, uh, although we do get one activation with our Maze Mind Tome, which is four damage, but things are not looking good. Um, so we are now on the end step of red. There's really nothing that can be done right now. So gets turned. Remember our Maze Mind Tome, we tapped it at the beginning of our turn. Um, at the very beginning of our turn. So we can't untap it until our untap uh, step. So, or our upkeep step, I should say. So, or uh, untap or upkeep, same thing. So the turn comes back to mid-range. We untap all of our goodies here. Untap Maze Mind Tome. Uh, and I think we're going to do it again. I think we activate our Maze Mind Tome for the fourth and final time. So that's four activations of Maze Mind Tome. So we activate it to scry to look at the top of our library. Remember when there are four counters or four activations of the Maze Mind Tome, it is now exiled. So we will put this into exile for mid-range and we gain four. So we're up to eight again, which is great. But we'll take a look at that top card. It is an Andatha Triome. So this is where, so remember, we're still in our upkeep. We haven't even drawn yet. So, you know, we can really think about this. So if we draw this card, it's a tapped land, so it's a land that would come into play tapped. We have a removal spell in our hand. Oh, man, this is tough. Bone Crusher Giant, more information for you. So Bone Crusher Giant also has some text on it. Whenever Bone Crusher Giant becomes the target of a spell, Bone Crusher Giant 
deals two damage to that spell's controller. So, if we were to target Bone Crusher Giant with Mythos of Nethroi, he would deal two damage to us. That's four damage. So we, we could target him this turn, or we could target him during combat. That's two damage. We would take two more. That's four damage on their turn. And then we have one turn after that. I think we just need, we need more interval. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. This also opens up the ability for us to start activating scavenging ooze. To start building up our life total and the 1-1 one -one counters on scavenging ooze. But remember, they have Rimrock Knight and a draw. They have Rimrock Knight that they can play next turn and a draw to find something off the top of their library to do more damage to us. Do we, do we want a land here? Do we want an untapped land here? I really don't think so, so we're going to bottom this. All right. Let's see what we get off the top. It's a castle lock to win. I should have taken it. We need, we need, uh, we need forests. Okay, so we're on the main phase of mid-range player's turn. He is going to tap the Jungle Hollow, the green and black land for green mana, and one of the castle locked lanes for black mana to cast Scavenging Ooze. Uh, this isn't a terrible play because we know their hand is empty. They can't kill it right now. Uh, they're tapped out. If they draw something, that would be horrible. If they draw another Bone Crusher Giant, that would be horrible for us. If they draw any of their removal spells that could potentially kill it, that's horrible for us. But we need to put something in the way, and we need to start using our forest mana on following turns to eat their graveyard and build up our ooze, build up, you know, gain the life, build up our ooze, stabilize the board, and we can keep three mana untapped to kill something on their turn. I think that's the best turn, the best thing that we have to do. Just a little bit more, okay? I know. Okay, so um, we play Scavenging Ooze. Scavenging Ooze does not have haste like Fervent Champion. Uh, so he has Summoning Sickness, so we can't do anything with him yet. Um, so he enters the battlefield. We're, we want to hold this mana open because Mythos of Nethroi is an instant. So we can use this on our opponent's turn when they try to attack us to kill the Bone Crusher Giant. And we could even potentially trade with the Fervent Champion, but we'll see if that's what we want to do. Okay, so uh, there's not much left that we want to do, so we want to pass the turn over. They don't have anything that they can do on our end step, so it is now back to Red's turn. Uh, and it is now Red's turn upkeep. So they untap all of their tapped goodies. Uh, I am going to... Um, feed my cat, which takes all of like five seconds. Do I leave the recording on? I mean, I can edit it out. Well, it would be easier to just... There, I'm just going to stop. Uh, no. I'm just going to... Okay. So he's eating. Alright, so... Uh, the turn is now going back to red. Um, so it is now their turn to untap. So they untap all their goodies. Anything that was tapped, they now untap, and they now draw for turn, and they draw another land. That's great. Okay, so they draw land, um, and then if I were red, or no, they drew land. If I were red, I probably wouldn't. They don't really have anything that they could play for five mana, and there's no reason they need to show us that they just drew land, so I would hold on to the land and not really reveal that to my opponent, make them kind of think about it. Um, and then I would just go straight to combat. Because they're not playing anything on their main phase. And attack with the Fervent Champion and with the Bone Crusher Giant. The reason it's a safe attack with the Fervent Champion is because you know, at the very worst, it would just trade with the Scavenging Ooze. Because our Fervent Champion is a 2-2. Two -two, and the Scavenging Ooze at most could be a 2-2 two -two right now. We have no untapped green 
sources to activate his ability to make him a 3-3 or 4-4 or 5-5. He's only ever going to be a 2-2 because we don't have the mana to make him bigger. So they would just trade with the Scavenger Goose, and Scavenger Goose is a huge problem for them because he gains me life, which is something they don't want me doing. And he, he, grow, he gets, grows bigger, which is something they don't want him doing because, you know, their cheap creatures get outvalued by him pretty quickly. So if he trades with Scavenger Goose here, he's happy. Uh, you know, a, and another thing is, Fervent Champion wouldn't actually trade with the Scavenger Goose because a, a Fervent Champion has something called First Strike. Now, first strike, how combat works, is when two uh, two creatures, uh, well, here, I'll, I'll try to explain it. So, he's attacking me with his 4-3 Bone Crusher Giant and his 2-2 two, two Fervent Champion. So, he, let's say his Fervent Champion didn't have that first strike ability, so let's just pretend he is attacking me with a 2-2. Two, two. These creatures could trade. I could decide he's attacking me with both of these guys, I'm going to block his Fervent Champion with my Scavenging Ooze, because they both have two power and two toughness. When they go together, uh, you know, two power hits two toughness, and it becomes zero, and that happens instantaneously for both, so they would both die and go to the graveyard. <coughs> but, Fervent Champion has something called First Strike. What First Strike is, is that creature's damage is dealt first, so before it's not done at the same time, Fervent Champion deals it first, and then Scavenger Goose would be done after if it survived. So it wouldn't because Fervent Champion would deal two damage first to Scavenger Goose. Scavenger Goose would, uh, its uh, toughness would be reduced to zero. It would die, and then that's it. Technically, Fervent Champion, well, yeah, that's it. It would just die, and then, yeah, then it's over. So that's actually a very good attack because there's nothing I can do either. I lose the Scavenger Goose. He wouldn't deal any damage to me because that's a, it's still a successful block. Scavenger Goose would have blocked Fervent Champion, but Fervent Champion wouldn't die because of First Strike. He dealt his damage first. Scavenger Goose died. Now, if Scavenger Goose was a 3-3 three, three, and he decided to attack, that is indicative that he has something in his hand to kill Scavenger Goose because... Fervent Champion with First Strike would deal his damage first to Scavenger Goose, and then at instant speed he could kill Scavenger Goose uh, with, like, another Bone Crusher Giant, so another two damage spell could kill the Scavenger Goose. Fervent Champion wouldn't die because the, the, the fight-combat interaction hasn't happened yet, and Scavenger Goose hasn't dealt its damage to Fervent Champion yet because Fervent Champion does it first. It's hard to explain. You know, so it's just like, it's like Fervent Champion gets a pre-combat fight or pre-combat attack on the creature that's blocking it before, you know, before anything happens, before the creature that's blocking it does its damage to Fervent Champion. But, so, in a world without First Strike, these two would both do two damage to each other at the same time. Both of their two toughnesses would go to zero and they would both die. But because Fervent uh, Champion has First Strike, it deals its damage first, so a block here would be very bad. I would just lose Scavenging Ooze, and that would be it. It would be a successful block. It would save me two damage. But there is something I can do right here, though. Uh, where the hell's my hand? So there is something I can do right now, and it is I can tap. So he's attacking me. I and you know. So what happens during combat is they declare their attackers. Now it is my turn to declare blockers, and I don't want to block anything. I don't want to just lose my ooze to Bone Crusher Giant right here, and uh, I'll, ex I'll explain here kind of just so you can really get the idea. Um, so let's say I wanted to block my ooze on the Bone Crusher Giant. That would be a, I mean, sometimes you just have to do that to save yourself, but in this scenario, I have enough life and I have a removal spell, so a block wouldn't be good, but let's just say I did want to do that. Let's say I was at four health and I just, I had to make this block to keep myself alive called a jump block, or I guess that's kind of the colloquial term for it, or the term that the magic community has come up with. Uh, it's, a, it's a block to, you know, that just kills one of your creatures and doesn't kill one of theirs. So if the Bone Crusher Giant is attacking me as a 4-3 and my Scavenger Goose is a 2-2 two -two that can't grow yet, because, again, I don't have the forest mana available to me. I have white and two black. Really regretting that white mana. So the 2-2 two -two Scavenger Goose and Bone Crusher Giant, Bone Crusher Giant does not have First Strike. 
So the damage is done at the same time. So Bone Crusher Giant and Scavenger Ooze would kind of get into combat. The Scavenger Ooze would do two damage to the Bone Crusher Giant, and the Bone Crusher Giant would do four damage to the Scavenger Ooze, reducing the Scavenger Ooze to negative two um, toughness, so it dies. And the Bone Crusher Giant would take two damage, so it would be down to one toughness and not die. Let's say, again, for argument's sake, let's say I had the forest. Uh, you know, I had a forest uh, at some point. Let's just, okay, forget all abilities, forget everything. Let's just say my scavenging ooze was a 3-3. Three, three. Um, Bone Crusher Giant would do four damage to the ooze. Um, so he would be negative one. And the ooze would do three damage to the Bone Crusher Giant, which would do zero. So both creatures would die, It would, and it would be a successful block, meaning no damage would get through to me. Now there is an ability like First Strike and Haste. It's one of these keyword abilities that appears underneath the creature's titles. You see where First Strike and Haste appear under here, under near where the creature title is. There's another uh, keyword that would appear here as well. There's one, uh, it doesn't appear anywhere on these cards. Uh, I think I might have a card with it in the mid-range deck, but it's called Trample. Now Trample means any excess combat damage dealt during combat is dealt to the creature's controller. So let's say my bone, or my, let's say Red's Bone Crusher Giant had trample. It doesn't, but let's say it did. So Red's Bone Crusher Giant is a 4 3 attacking, again, in this situation, the f scavenger uses a 3 3. So the 4 3 would do 4 damage to scavenger use and 1 damage to me because it's getting its excess damage to the scavenger use. It's over the scavenging ooze's toughness. So the scavenging ooze would be reduced to negative one, and that negative one damage is technically a representation of the damage that's being dealt to me. So I would be dealt one damage, my scavenging ooze would die, and Bone Crusher Giant would die as well. Uh, but the damage would get through, but because he doesn't have trample, no damage gets through. Bone Crusher Giant could be a one million and three, uh, you know, one million power and three toughness and attack. And if he doesn't have trample, none of it is getting through. It's a successful block. So that's just, that's that's something very important to kind of keep in mind when it comes to uh, combat and damage and all that. Um, excess damage, you know, unless trample is part of the equation, excess damage doesn't mean a thing. Again, he could be a million toughness or a million power and three toughness and none of it would get through. So, um, so that's it. So my, uh, that, so yeah, so that's it. So back to reality. Scavenging use is a 2-2. I don't have forest mana available to me to grow him or do anything to make any good blocks, but I do have a removal spell in my hand. Uh, and so I am going to tap all three mana available to me, and I am going to cast this Mythos of Nethroi on the Bone Crusher Giant to kill it. Uh, remember, Bone Crusher Giant has that ability where spells that target it deal two damage to the controller, so I'm going to take two. Mythos of Netheroy resolves. I'm going to start trying to move things faster here. Bone Crusher Giant in combat dies at instant speed, so it, it you know its combat doesn't resolve. Uh, I, I'm leaving the Fervent Champion unblocked. I don't want my Scavenging Ooze to die. I take two. Um, and now combat is over. And that's it. It is now Red's second main phase. They could play. Remember, they have a mountain in their hand. I think they should just hold on to it. There's no, like, what could you do with... I mean, you could hold it up. I mean, I guess you would actually play it, because, like, why would you want to... You could hold it up and, like, feign a removal spell, I guess. So I think on their, on their end step, they definitely want to tap two mana to play that Rimrock Knight that they had in Exile because of the adventure. Again, cards normally cannot be played from Exile, only these adventure cards because of their overpower shittiness um, <laughs> and there are intricacies to adventures it's not like every adventure card in exile can be played there's sometimes where they're put into exile and can't be played uh, but if they're cast for their adventure side first they get put into exile by their own controller but you know if somebody else puts it in the there's a whole thing but it doesn't matter it's a little convoluted and a little too much for a new player but basically we're going to be taking rimrock knight out of exile because he can and placing it onto the battlefield for two mana. And then I guess, I mean, if you want to get into the no 
nooks and crannies of magic and theory and, you know, what they should and shouldn't do. I'm just going to say they play it. They play the mana, and they have three untapped red mana open, but no cards in hand. Oh, fuck. I know this card. So, <laughs> this card is a little damaged, and I know exactly what card it is. <sighs> Son of a bitch. Oh, man. Midrange is in trouble. So much trouble. Okay. <clears throat> so, there's nothing. Uh, Midrange now has nothing in their hand. So there's nothing I can do. I can't look at the top card of my library or anything. So uh, red is done. We go to end step. Uh, now we go back to mid range. We go to upkeep. We untap everything. We draw a card. Son of a bitch. Did I put the other one on the bottom, didn't I? Son of a bitch. Okay, so mid range has drawn a triumph, which I guess isn't the worst thing in the world, but it's also not the best thing in the world either. It's a terrible draw at low life. So this is a land that can be tapped for one of any three colors, but it enters the battlefield tapped, so it doesn't provide us any mana instantly, and it also has this thing called cycling for three, so we can pay three mana, discard this card, and draw a card. So for three mana, we tap three mana at instant speed. We can discard this, draw a new card, and that might be the best thing we can do with it because if we play this tapped, we don't get to draw another card at any point. I think this is just what we have to do. Um, we can hold up our activation of Scavenging Moons' ability until our opponent's turn, so I think that's all we do. So our main phase, we do nothing. Our combat step, we do nothing because we want to hold back the Scavenging Moons to block on their turn. Um, we go to our end step. We don't want to do anything. We, or our second main phase, and then we go to our end step. We don't want to do anything. Now it is Red's turn again. So Red will untap, untap, untap. And they will draw for their turn, and they draw a Robber of the Rich. Robber of the Rich is a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two with haste and reach, but re uh, nobody remembers reach. And it's... Uh, it's got an ability that is kind of irrelevant right, right right now, and it's like too complicated to explain, so I'm just not going to really go into it. So um, so they draw that. We're on now red's main phase. Red would pay two mana and cast Robber of the Rich on their main phase. Robber of the Rich, remember, it has, I just mentioned it, haste. If you remember, haste is the ability to not have summoning sickness, so this can attack this turn, which sucks. So they play Robber of the Rich. And now red decides to attack with all, I I would assume, right? Yeah, that's all that makes sense. So the reason red would attack with all is because that's lethal. <laughs> Wait, no, it's not. Not necessarily. Okay, so red would attack with all, in my opinion your opponent is on four life we only have we at most have one activation of scavenging ooze so that would and uh, the only thing we could do is trade with the rimrock knight we we could gain one life up to five and take four which would bring us to one and that's the only block we could make we couldn't block either of these guys because otherwise it's lethal so they attack with all So, this is a lethal attack. If this is a lethal attack, if it goes unblocked or if we block incorrectly. So, mid range is going to make a la last ditch effort here. Tap three mana. We're going to tap both of our lock castle locked flames and the boulder uh, boulder loft pathway to cycle this and dot the triumph. Remember, we're playing three mana to discard it. And draw a new card. So we're going to discard this and draw a card. And it's another scavenging ooze. If this was green mana, if this was green mana, this whole game is so much different. And I never needed the white mana. God damn it. I played that as white mana. Oh, man, I hated green. I should have thought about that too so this is kind of a retrospective and this is a good way to kind of like if you ever record your games or look at games or something like that i played 
this is white mana. And admittedly, I think I was a little bit biased because I knew they had Ember Cleave and stuff like that. And I was also kind of more focused on learning or teaching how somebody else how to play this game as opposed to like playing the game itself. Uh, but if I played this as green mana for future activations of Scavenger Use, which in the long run would have been better for stabilizing and gaining life and stuff, I could have been activating this on multiple turns. I would have had a good blocker. Uh, but I played this Boulder Loft Pathway instead of green as white because I wanted to be able to play my Mythos of Nethroi to kill artifacts or equipments or non-land permanents like an Embercleave. But I really should have thought I had an Agonizing Remorse which could have taken the Embercleave and I could have just used the um, Mythos of Nethroi as creature removal. So if this was green, I think this game goes totally different. So we draw another Scavenging Ooze. So we tap our Jungle Hollow. We will exile a Fervent Champion from their graveyard. So Scavenging Ooze is now a 3-3. And we have to block the Rimrock Knight. So Scavenging Ooze blocks the Rimrock Knight. We gain one life. That is important. Scavenging Ooze now dies. Goes to the graveyard. Rimrock Knight also dies. Goes to the graveyard. Four damage gets through on the rim uh, with the Robber of the Rich and the Fervent Champion. We are at one life. Uh, there's no other plays for red. Turn now. And we only have one mana open and can't play Scavenging Ooze at instant speed. The turn now goes back to mid-range. Uh, so let's let's play correctly. Uh, we have the upkeep where we untap everything. There's nothing we can really do. And we draw for turn. <sighs> Shit! Oh my god. Okay, so... two creatures. We have a Scavenging Ooze and we have a Grack Maw Skyclave Ravager. And both of them have green in their casting cost. So if this green mana, if this mana was green, we could cast both of them and have two blockers next turn. <clears throat> but when Fervent Champion gets blocked, it deals one, it deals one damage to the opposing player. We would die anyway. Yeah, so this is game, no matter what, no matter, even if this is green mana, we die, but if this was green mana earlier, we probably could have stabilized and done better. So, even if, in, in my fantasy world, if this is green mana, we play both of them, right? Play, we tap out, we play all five mana for Ooze and, and Gragmaw, play both of them, they untap, they attack, and that's just it. Even if we get successful blocks, when he becomes blocked, remember the Tormentor's Helm. Uh, when it when this creature becomes blocked, deals one damage to the opponent, we're at one life. Boom, we're dead. So, that's game. Uh, and if we only play Grack Maw, they have two attackers. We block one and we take the damage from the other. Um, and they, they're doing more than one damage, so. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Shoot. If that was green mana, I shouldn't, I should have thought about that. I should have just left it as green mana. Oh, man. That's crushing. That really is crushing. This was fun, though. I kind of want to play again. What are we at? We're at 20 minutes, and I think the other... We're probably, all, we're probably at like an hour and a half. So... and we were so close to some really great spells Ugh. on mid-range I mean I might just play by myself <laughs> not not on camera okay um, so yeah that's it that's the video um, yeah so my, my life total has now been reduced to zero because of their attack their lethal attack and the game is over and that is Magic the Gathering that is very Magic the Gathering because Mono Red is one of the most popular decks. Um, so, yeah, that's it. That's how the game is played, and kind of, I know.
there's a lot more to the game itself, but I think I tried to explain kind of the main points of it. Uh, and I hope, you know, those of you who come to my channel to watch the gaming stuff, if you watch this and kind of understand Magic now, maybe you'll get a little bit more interested. Um, and then for those of you who are here for Magic, this is Magic, and it's Paper Magic, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, even if, you know, obviously if you guys are Mythic players and Platinum players and Diamond players or Bronze players, hopefully, you know, just watching and listening, you, you enjoyed it. So thanks, everybody, for watching my channel. Thank you guys. Again, this is a 70 subscriber, 70 subscriber special. Um, thank you guys for subscribing. Thank you guys for watching. I, uh, I'm really enjoying uh, making content for you guys. Um, yeah, I think this one's going to be a good one. Uh, obviously, you know, a lot of this stuff is going to be difficult for you to see and stuff like that. I don't imagine that you're following along super intently, but I, I hope it was enough for you to, you know, kind of get the gist of how the game is played and, you know, what to do. So thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, we'll catch you in the next one.